بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم لجميع الحضور الرجاء لمن يرغب بالاستماع إلى هذه المحاضرة باللغة العربية النقر على زر الترجمة بالأسفل لأن هذه المحاضرة ستقام باللغة الإنجليزية Welcome everybody Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be Uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this newest event held uh, by the Asian Studies Program at the King Faisal Center uh, for Research and Islamic Studies. Uh, we hold such uh, events on a monthly basis, so please keep an eye on our social media uh, for alerts for future similar events. Uh, today, we are very much honored to have with us Dr. Professor Aisha Seljuk Assembal, uh, who will be giving a lecture today on a topic of considerable interest and growing research attention, namely Japan, uh, Japan's involvement uh, with the Muslim world during the interwar and second world war periods. Uh, Dr. Assembal is really a pillar in her field. Uh, she has had a very diverse and very rich academic journey, uh, studying in Turkey, in Japan, as well as in the United States. She received uh, her PhD from Columbia University in Japanese history. Uh, she has really been a recipient of many awards and fellowships, uh, including from Humboldt, uh, Germany's premier uh, funding grant. Uh, she has also written extensively on the topic and her books are widely cited in the field, including uh, a major book that had been published recently, Japan and the Silk Road, which came out in 2017. Uh, as is typically the case with such events, um, we will give the speaker somewhere between 40 to 45 minutes, after which we will um, give room to the audience members to pose their questions. I ask everyone to use the Q&A box below to type it as the lecture itself is ongoing or even subsequently. Um, and without further ado, uh, Dr. Simbel, thank you again for joining us and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. As I uh, mentioned to my young colleague, uh, I visited Saudi Arabia back in 2008, and I was a visiting professor in Ifet College. Um, believe it or not, the topic that I taught was Japanese history. So <laughs> I hope that the students enjoyed. Um, let me uh, try to uh, share my screen. And we'll move on from there. Um, okay, is this fine? Are you able to yes. see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, the topic is very complex. I call it Japan as the savior of the Muslim world. Of course, this is their, you know, um, self-identity and the identity that was given to them by some Muslim activists. Uh, and uh, the underlying theme, I suppose, from a conceptual perspective will be transnational nationalism. I know that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but transnational in the sense that these are nationalists in diaspora. And they are trying to conduct their idea of nationalism and maybe uh, transcendental uh, versions of it, like pan-Islam, uh, in a diaspora uh set setting and hence they form a network and empire here empire means the empire of japan so transnational connections transnational encounters and empire um briefly put uh at least this was back certainly in the you know uh 1980s and 1990s maybe it's not so valid today but most people uh, do not remember that before World War II, Japanese nationalists showed an Asianist face as savior to the world's Muslims whom they wanted to befriend as allies in the construction of a new Asia between 1900 and 1945 under Japan's hegemony that was to replace that of the Western empires. In other words, uh, there is a moment when Japan is very proactive in trying to inculcate uh, a face that Japan is the special friend of the world of Islam, unlike the Western empires that exploit and uh, 
oppress the Muslim peoples of the world. We are a friend and we will emancipate, help emancipate Muslims from their yoke, so to speak. This paper will try to discuss the complexity of the encounter. And of course, a session like this is not enough. Uh, linking the intellectual and political history of the Muslim diaspora activists, Muslim Japanese, Japan's Asianist intellectuals, politicians that are coeval with Japan's imperial intelligence strategy. Uh, intellectual history is a field unto itself, but we have to also remember that intellectual discourse can be part of different layers of activity, political, uh, <clears throat> economic, and in this case, because of Japan's ambition to build an empire, Japan's imperial intelligence strategy. Briefly put, uh, I, can, I guess we can, you know, uh, outline our talk to a chronology between 1900 and 1945. The first phase is the formation of the Meiji period, 1868-1912, Japan's Islam policy. I'm providing the characters for those of you. I think you have some uh, members uh, like Muhammad, you know, who uh, is uh, uh, totally uh, <clears throat> uh, versatile in Chinese, just so that, you know, you can see the kind of characters that they are, you know, choosing and it has implications. So this was Meiji Japan's geopolitical strategy of the Imperial Army, one of our protagonists, the army, after the 1905 Russo-Japanese War. Japanese Pan-Asianism, a special group of people in Japan, roughly maybe around, you know, at best 10,000, uh, mostly ex-samurai, who cannot be employed in any uh, government office because they were part of a rebellion back in 1877, which made it impossible for them to have uh, public uh, employment. So they became uh, the language experts, uh, the field uh, uh, <clears throat> investigators for the Imperial Army, and they had an own, their own vision. In other words, I don't want to uh, stretch this cynical tone that I'm sure you've noticed in my you know, conversation too far. In other words, they believed in what they said as well. So it's a complex, you know, situation where they believe in what they said, you know, are thinking, but at the same time, they're working for the uh, Imperial Army. Japanese Pan-Asianists adopted the cause of Muslim nationalists and Pan-Islamists uh, who came to Japan at the turn of the 20th century uh, to support their activities against Western colonial empires. Here, when we say Western colonial empires, we primarily mean Russia and Britain. The second phase is World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution to the outbreak of World War II, where Islam policy now is described in Japanese policy papers in uh, Japanese parliament diet debates as a citadel, as a wall against communism. In other words, the citadel of anti-communism in Asia. There are Japanese pan-Asianist intellectuals who develop this argument. Kitaiki is one of them, for example. There's also a second percep uh, perception of uh, how politics and Islam can get together in this kind of global uh, futuristic uh, uh, vision for Japan. And that is that Islamic activism, I find this one interesting, frankly, for uh, Islamic activism is awakening the social energy that Japan's Asianism can use as a global international against the Western empires. As you will, I'm sure, discern, it's a kind of creative adaptation of the Marxist idea of the international. Okawa Shume, in particular, who has a background in uh, uh, German and Indian philosophy from Tokyo University, is, I suppose, the uh, spokesman for this uh, uh, discourse. 
the Bolshevik Revolution is very important because it brought Muslims from other regions to East Asia. Of course, in East Asia, as you know very well, uh, there are uh, uh, communities of Muslims who've been there since the Middle Ages. In other words, the Chinese Muslims of China, overseas Chinese, Muslims of today's Indonesia, millions of people. So in addition to the existing Muslim communities of various uh, ethnic, uh, cultural, and national identities, now a new population of uh, refugees, emigres, arrive in East Asia. And they form, they help rather form, the so-called Japanese Muslim community. This is how they are termed. Most of them are actually Tatars from the Penza, Volga River region, and also from Kazakh region, which as you know, is the center of uh, Islamic intellectual and uh, uh, modernist currents during the 19th century under the Romanov Empire and the beginning of a, you know, awakening that uh, the Muslims of Russia, uh, they deserve their autonomy, at least uh, they deserve to have their own modern schools, and they certainly don't want to be Christianized. So these Tatars arrive in Manchuria, in Shanghai, and then some of them sort of spill over to Japan and they form diaspora communities in Kobe, in Tokyo, and other cities of uh, uh, the Japanese colonial territories. So uh, they them particularly become instrumental in the rise of Islam policy as part of the Asianist international that the Japanese government uh, professes uh, after the 1961 Japanese invasion of Manchuria and the outbreak of the 1937 Sino-Japanese war. This is also the period where we witness Japanese Muslim pilgrimages or the Hajj to Mecca and Medina, ostensibly to perform their religious uh, obligations, but they had other, of course, you know, uh, objectives in mind as well. The major pilgrimages in question, which we know it would be the ones in uh, 1910, early on, uh, between the first Japanese Muslim, uh, Umar Yamaoka Kotaro, 1924, 1934, 1936. These pilgrimages are important because the Chinese nationalists also organized Chinese pilgrimages, Hajj, uh, to the holy cities to compete with the Japanese agenda of representing themselves as the savior or the friend of Islam. So it's a very, and there have been some publications on the topic as well. Finally, this period is also important in my mind because it's the birth of Japanese perceptions of Islam and the tradition of Japanese Islamic scholarship a legacy which has continued to this date. The third and final phase is briefly put Islam policy during World War II as a covert and military strategy Japanese Muslim field agents trained in uh, uh, the languages uh, of uh, uh, the Muslim communities of Asia, in particular uh, Arabic, and also uh, the local languages of today's Indonesia and Malaysia, Malay. Uh, they are in the field collaborating with the uh, local nationalists and the activists in Malaysia and Indonesia, helping the entry of Japan during World War II. The legacy of uh, this uh, experience, in my opinion, is in part political Islam, the arguments of political Islam at a certain activist uh, level, which has carried on even in the post-Second World War period, a Japanese perception of Islam as a spiritual message because there is a distinct Japanese interpretation by those who've converted, which I think can be described as a kind of, you know, Japanese Muslim spiritual interpretation of the spiritual tradition. 
and geopolitical strategy towards Chinese Muslims, Turkic peoples, Southeast Asians, and finally, of course, Japanese Islamic studies uh, scholarship. Uh, the background, there's a background, of course, there's always a background to things, you know, <laughs> and the background is the beginning of Ottoman Japanese interaction in relations in the late 19th century when the Ottoman Empire, um, especially uh, the um, uh, sovereign uh, Abdul Hamid II was keenly interested in forming some kind of amicable relations with this rising star of the East. So in 1889, the Ottoman government sent a goodwill mission, the Arturo Frigate, to sort of uh, uh, begin uh, unofficial but amicable relations. But unfortunately, the Arturo Frigate sank confronted with a typhoon on its return voyage on September the 18th, 1890, and most of its uh, 650 officers and crew drowned off the shores of uh, uh, the south coast of uh, uh, Japan overlooking the Pacific Ocean. As a result of this, uh, a store is opened in Istanbul. This is important because I call this period twilight diplomacy. There's a, a problems in the background about international law that the Ottoman government does not want to, you know, uh, mm, adhere to. And therefore they constantly refuse the Japanese requests insistently on signing an official treaty of trade. The Ottomans say, oh, we're friends, but no treaty, we don't like treaties, you know, and we can just sort of develop our informal means and they do. Um, means of conducting our relations. And this store is a conduit for that, uh, founded by um, the merchant manager Yamada Torajiro and the owner, the investor, a retired naval officer, Nakamura Kenjiro, in 1892. The store conducts the business, the trade between the Ottoman Empire and Meiji Japan. Uh, for most of the years between 1892 and uh, 1914, but it also acts as an entrepot of passing on messages, of uh, making appointments with the Ottoman court, and for basically functioning like an informal or unofficial consul general, if you will. So there is diplomacy, but it's not official diplomacy, it's informal diplomacy. And uh, that's how the Japanese and the Ottomans uh, interact during those years. Um, Yamada Torajiro is interest, uh, important in this respect because he wrote the first book about the Ottoman world and from his perception, what he learned of Islam, the Turks, uh, the region, in the late 19th century while he was resident in Istanbul. It's the first book published by a Japanese person who learned Istanbul Turkish, basically, at least at the conversational level. And it was published in 1911. I've uh, translated it uh, over many years. <laughs> it took me 10 years to finish the translation, but it's just come out in uh, 2021. And we tried to emulate, as you can see, even the cover of the original work itself. Uh, this is the title page for those of you, you know, who can read the uh, uh, classical Chinese writing. Uh, Yamada Torajiro himself, having received a medal from the Ottoman Sultan and uh, dressed up in a scholar's robe uh, for the uh, occasion. So let's now plunge into the first phase, the 1900s. This is when Muslim nationalists I call them nationalists because, you know, sometimes when uh, turn of the century Muslim uh, intellectuals of Egypt, uh, of uh, uh, South are, uh, you know, described in uh, intellectual history, they're simply seen as uh, global pan-Islamists. Yes, they are global pan-Islamists, but they are also nationalists at the same time. One shouldn't forget that, you know, people could keep two identities together, you know. And Pan-Islam and national identity building, I think, were, you know, uh, interactive with each other. I mean, they didn't feel any problem about that. And certainly, uh, 
That's why we shouldn't necessarily, you know, totally separate them today uh, because of our deconstruction of uh, uh, the concept of the nation. So, pan Islamist transcendentalists and Muslim nationalists critical of Western imperialism and colonialism, uh, meaning Britain and Russia, flock to Tokyo that they choose as a political haven. In other words, Tokyo becomes the Paris of the political emigre in uh, the early 20th century. These are such individuals as the famous uh, Kadir Abdurashid Ibrahim, originally from Siberia, but educated in uh, the Kazan region and later on actually in Arabia, where he had his you know, traditional scholarly education in Medina. Uh, the Egyptian former captain of the Egyptian army before the British occupation and Ahmed Fazl Bey, an Indian Muslim, part Islamist, socialist, uh, Mulevi Muhammad Barakatullah, uh, a Russia Kazan uh, intellectual of the 20th century in especially Tatar nationalism, Ayaz Isaki. Again from Russia, Bashkurdistan, a former officer of the Roman Romanov uh, Imperial Army, Abdul Hai Kurban Ali, who became the community leader in uh, the uh, uh, migration of the uh, Bashkurt and the Kazan escaping from the Bolshevik Revolution and the Civil War to Manchuria and to Japanese occupied territories. Again, from Russia, Penza originally, uh, uh, Musa Jarullah Bigyev, who is known to have been the most distinguished Islamic uh, scholar of his generation. And finally, a mysterious figure that I'm still investigating. But, you know, we still don't have the full picture here. Uh, from Saudi Arabia, a young Turk, an officer of the Ottoman army, who was a close friend of Enver Pasha, the Pan-Turkist. You know him very well, I'm assuming. Tevfik Pasha, as he self-styled himself, who ends up in East Asia. And later on, ultimately, the family will settle in Turkey and they are known as the Sherifolu family. I've met with his uh, son and his uh, uh, grandchildren. Abdurashid Ibrahim is a very uh, enigmatic figure, a pan-Islamist activist and a scholar uh, who had medrasa education, uh, who also served as imam in uh, uh, Japan in uh, the 1930s and 40s. He is one of those representatives of what I call the <coughs> globe trotters of the turn of the century. These are activists. Uh, and he is trying very hard. He's going from one, if you will, uh, country to another. He's trying to convince power brokers to help the emancipation of Muslims everywhere, but particularly in Tataristan as well, you know, uh, his uh, homeland, so to speak. Ahmed Fazl Bey is a rather uh, mysterious, again, figure. We know little of him, but we know that when Abdurish Ibrahim arrived in Japan in 1908, he found Ahmed Fazl Bey. And he and Barakatullah from India, they actually started publishing an English language journal known as Islamic Fraternity, uh, which, uh, as you can probably assume, was quite critical of uh, the British Empire. They tried to be discreet in their language, uh, but uh, news from the Muslim world, uh, the developments going on uh, at that time, uh, including, for example, reports on the Balkan Wars, on what's happening uh, all over in uh, Africa, in uh, uh, Europe, and in Asia, uh, the British put pressure on the Japanese government. It had a short-lived life, so that it was, you know, um, after a while it was uh, discontinued. But it's an interesting period. Ahmed Fazl Bey, for example, is quite representative of this Muslim enthusiasm about Japan as savior. If we can get the rising star of the East, Japan, to help the Muslim cause in our own geographies, wherever that is, well, maybe, you know, they can help uh, the um, liberation of Muslims from colonial rule, from Western hegemony and so on. This, this is sort of their way of thinking. 
And Ahmed Fazlu certainly uh, was uh, uh, very much uh, against the British occupation of Egypt. Um, his career didn't end up too successful. He returned back to uh, Cairo and uh, is said to have sort of, you know, passed away rather dissipated and disappointed about, you know, his projects and so on. But he's a kind of interesting figure. Now, the second Japanese phase is the parallel policy of the imperial army. Okay, this is where the army gets it. Islam policy for the empire, they say this. I've recently been reading the memoirs of General Utsunomi Ataro, the vice chief of the army, general staff, head of the second bureau of intelligence, and that's exactly what he says. These Muslims, he says, they come for our help, fine, and we will support them because we need them. It's a very interesting, you know, sentence that he uses in his uh, diary. He says, we need them in our imminent clash with Christian powers in the future. It is very interesting because when I share this with my Japanese uh, colleagues in modern history, they're very surprised. They're saying, well, we thought that he would use a term such as Western powers. Uh, you know, uh, in the secular terms, that is, you know, sort of like secularizing the conflict between, you know, Islam and uh, this. But no, he uses a very, I should say, you know, um, he picks a term from rather traditional terminology and says, you know, uh, we will use these Muslims, they will support us in our clash with Christian powers. He sees the West as Christian in his diary. I thought that's an interesting point. This is his diary itself. Uh, we're still reading it. Uh, it's a very important source uh, for this information. And there's new terminology here. Um, the general argues, he's, by the way, one of the early ones to invent this particular, you know, term, Kaikyo Seisaka. And note, please, he's using the term for Islam in Chinese Islam. In other words, the Japanese interpret at this point the Islamic world from the terminology that they picked up from Chinese Muslim literature and their understanding of, you know, Chinese Muslims as part of East Asia's history. So that's, I think, a very significant point to remember because it influences their scholarship as well. The argument of Utsunomiya is very straightforward, something like Japan should befriend the Ottoman Caliph Sultan, meaning Abdullah II, thus gain global influence over 200 million Muslim nations who will be grateful. Sort of, in my opinion, a kind of uh, moral uh, normative, you know, uh, discourse here. And he's very critical of the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the guy Busho, for their failure to sign a treaty with Ottoman Istanbul because they insist on European international law for ter extraterritoriality. Well, the Ottoman bureaucrats always said, no, we don't want to give any extraterritoriality privileges to Japan now in this late game. So this is the origins of Islam policy that becomes a core concept from the Japanese uh, perspective of geopolitical strategy. Uh, that is advocated and practiced throughout the 1930s and 40s in the Asianist circles, international relations uh, uh, policies, and ultimately military strategy. Um, if you uh, look at Utsunomiya's report in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you can see pretty much you know, what he means by his policy. It's very real politic. He says that if we sign a treaty of equality with Ottoman Turkey, well, this will make the Turks and Muslims very friendly towards Japan, sort of a simplistic view in my opinion, but you know, uh, and that means that they will um, uh, lease territory to us uh, in the final stop of the German-Turkish Baghdad Railway in Kuwait, uh, about that, and extend commercial shipping lines from Bombay to the Persian Gulf. This is a general who's trying to compete with the British Empire, basically and open up fertile agricultural land of Mesopotamia and Asia Minor for Japanese immigrants of poor farmers. I thought that this would have been a good policy. Actually, they would have probably created an agricultural revolution, but uh, be that as it may be, join the final 
financial investment of the Baghdad Railway, acquire shipping rights on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, acquire port territory in the last stop of the Red Sea Railway for Japanese shipping lines to Europe. So as you can see, it's very real politic, very geo strategy, uh, strategic and so on. Now, I want to get into a second topic and that is trying to analyze and understand the persona and the perspectives of the Japanese Muslims working for the empire. These are individuals, they're recorded, uh, we know them. The first Japanese Muslim who is presented always as the first Haji or pilgrim uh, with the Muslim name of Umar, Yamoka Kotaro. Uh, and he arrived in uh, Arabia in 1909 together with the Qadr Ibrahim who converted him and met with important notables of Mecca and Medina discussing things, not only Islam, the religion, but politics the future of Japan's collaboration with Muslims of the world, and in particular to form friend relations uh, with the local notables of Arabia and Japan. It's a message that arrives in 1909. Haji uh, Nur Tanaka Ippe is a very important person. He is the student of Yamaoka, and he's the one who actually also performed pilgrimage in 1924 and 1930. Uh, 34. Haji Yamauchi, I'm using the names that they present themselves as. So you can see it's a kind of sort of public identity with which they are introducing themselves to the Muslim communities where they are residing or where they are active. Muhammad Abdul Miniam Hosokawa Susumi, Muhammad Abdul Aliz Kori Shozo, Muhammad Dimet Enomoto Momotaro, Haji Sadi Suzuki. Now, uh, these individuals are, you know, uh, collectively sometimes um, criticized by scholars of Islam by saying they are bogus Muslims. Well, maybe, yes. But when you read their memoirs, you can see that, well, that's the way that they are interpreting their Muslim identity. They are working for the empire. Uh, Yamoka Kotaro says, i have converted to Islam because I'm helping the Japanese emperor, okay? Uh, he's very straightforward about this. He's not trying to keep it a secret. In other words, he's not sort of presenting himself as a Muslim and keeping his political agenda secret. It's, it's out there. That's the way that they have formed a kind of worldview, if you will. Um, at the same time, of course, they are truly political agents on the ground. In other words, they are adopting the Muslim identity, learning the rituals, some of them studying classical Arabic and so on, so that they want to befriend the Muslim um, communities that they are sent to, to gather information. For example, uh, Yamoka Kotaro is a specialist of Russian language. So he is active in Harbin working for Japanese intelligence in the heart, collecting information. Uh, Haji Nur Tanaka Ippe is a specialist of Chinese, both classical Chinese, as well as uh, converse, conversational Chinese, a scholar, agent, uh, believer in Islam from his own perspective, you know, a complex figure, Tanaka Ippe. The others perhaps can be seen as kind of more maybe uh, political identities because they convert and immediately go on a pilgrimage in, in 1934, and they will end up in the field in Indonesia of today and Malaysia during World War II, working as field agents in activating the ulema against, you know, uh, the former uh, Dutch uh, masters of uh, uh, the Dutch Indies. Some of them, by the way, they stayed after the surrender of Japan, and they were part of the uh, uh, Indonesian resistance and the Malaysian resistance against the return of the British and Dutch empires after the uh, surrender of Germany and Japan, a note which I think should be remembered. Now, Ahmed Bunhachiro Ariga is somewhat different. I mean, he's not a you know uh, field agent or something like that, but he's a kind of very interesting persona he converted from Christianity to Islam, 
all his, he worked all his life to disseminate the Islamic faith to whomever, whatever community that he met. He was kind of like, let's put it this way, a self-styled missionary, really believing in his cause. But he also at the same time justified it because he was working for the awakening of Asia. He was a pan-Asianist. So in his mind, his Islamic missionary activity and pan-Asianism are compatible. He had business in India, in South Asia, and he is the first translator of the Quran in 1938. I'm not so sure though, whether he translated it from classical Arabic or from available you know, European sources. One would have to check that. Uh, it's considered to have been a reasonably good translation before the real translations came out. The travel accounts and the other works of Japanese Muslims are very interesting. Uh, Yavoka Kotaro's, for example, Mystery of the World, Travels in Arabia, gives an account of his experience in Arabia in 1909. Tanaka Ippei, he's important because he translated into Japanese the famous Chinese Muslim writer, Liu Jianyang's work, on the real record of the last prophet of the Islam. This is a classic Chinese Muslim uh, uh, manuscript uh, and it was written in classical Chinese. You can also see the Japanese, they are immersing themselves into uh, the uh, tradition of Islam in East Asia because they know classical Chinese. So um, actually Tanaka Ippe translated uh, 18th century classical Chinese, Muslim Chinese, that is to say, essays, tracks, uh, an important uh, current field of research, for example, by Sachiko uh, Murata, if you know her, you know, uh, who recently published, uh, I believe, Pearls of Sufi Wisdom, uh, a translation of an 18th century Chinese Muslim. So later on, this was published in uh, 1941 and uh, ultimately it was republished again. These Japanese Muslims always went around with their, you know, sort of Islamic looking clothing. That's how they like to present themselves. This is Tanaka Ippe and his biography, of the real record biography of the Prophet Muhammad from a J Chinese Muslim original. Um, I'm going to briefly quote from uh, his writings because I think it's very representative Japanese Muslims of this generation who try to create a syncretic connection between Islam and the um, esoteric religious traditions of East Asia. Each one has their own argument. They're always trying to link Islam to something in East Asian religious, uh, especially esoteric, uh, mystic uh, uh, traditions. For example, Tanaka Ippe says, when I thought about the view of the universe, which was the core idea of the old Chinese belief system, I could not help but see how the divinity of Muhammad resembled that of Kami, the Shinto word for God or gods in Japan. I found a relationship between Confucianism and Islam, as well as a relationship between Confucianism and Zen Buddhism. As a result, I have discovered the connection between Islam and Shintoism. This is very interesting. I've met many Japanese Muslim scholars of uh, classical uh, Islamic thought who still carry some very derivative versions of this argument, not as sophisticated as Tanaka Ippe, but this idea that um, Shinto spirituality and Islamic spirituality somehow are bonded they are very similar to each other. In other words, therefore, it would be easier for a Japanese person to convert to Islam because there's already that familiar background. It's, I think, a very sort of, you know, idealistic kind of almost romanticized interpretation, but it's very characteristic. Uh, this is his book, The Travel Account of a White Cloud, where he actually narrates his visit in 1924 to uh, Saudi Arabia and his experiences it needs to be translated, I think, at some point very quickly. And this is again Tanaka Ipe, our sacred Mikado, meaning the emperor of Japan, 
syncretized Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and Christianity on the policy, absorb them and do not abandon them. So in other words, uh, he's very much sort of like very representative of this Japanese interpretation of what I call situational faith. For example, Tanaka Ippei never really gave up Buddhism and the Shinto rituals. Uh, he would uh, conduct his uh, uh, Islamic, you know, uh, <clears throat> religious uh, uh, duties and rituals, but at the same time go to the Shinto shrine, at the same time go to the Buddhist temple, do his Zen Buddhist meditation. For him, there was no contradiction. In other words, they were all compatible with each other. The person who stands out, I think, in all of this, and who's been very influential, if you ask me, he's been very influential in Turkey. I don't know whether he's influential in uh, Saudi Arabia, but in Turkey, definitely, among current Islamic scholarship, is Toshiko, a genius, actually, probably, because he was a polylingual, you know, uh, talent. He knew about, you know, nine to ten languages by heart. I mean, he was versatile in uh, uh, many classical uh, languages, including modern ones. He was an exceptional scholar of Islam. And again, a curious byproduct of the kind of political, historical environment that I'm sure that you've noticed is strong in my, you know, uh, narrative. But uh, it also produced, you see, Izutsu Toshiko. He looked at, he was, first of all, a professor of Keio University, so all his books are published by Keio University right now. Uh, they have been republished recently. He chose, he was a philosopher from the Department of Philosophy. He chose Islamic philosophy because he wanted to construct a comparative frame of different philosophies in search of a higher universal philosophy and universal mystic philosophical concepts. He learned classical Arabic from the Tatar diaspora. Ibrahim and Musa Jarullah gave him lessons, private lessons in classical Arabic. And they were very impressed with the fact that he just sort of completely, you know, was immersed into mastery of classical Arabic in a rather short period of time. Um, his argument was that Islam, Taoism, and Zen Buddhism, though unrelated to each other, they shared patterns of mystic thought that had significance as the history of universal philosophical thought. So his two works, which are very important, Ethical Religious Concepts in the Quran, uh, published by McGill. He was the founder of the Islamic Studies Department in McGill University in the post-war period, by the way. Uh, and also his later work, which is cited by many Islamic scholars, Sufism and Taoism a comparative study of the key philosophical concepts in Ibn Arabi, Lao Tzu, and Chuan Tzu that came out originally in 1966-67. It's been uh, later on, the English version was published by University of California, Berkeley. So, um, you know, Turkish scholars of Islam, uh, they have a rather naive, in my opinion, you know, uh, hope that uh, maybe Izutsu converted to Islam, you know, while he was doing all the study. I'm afraid he didn't, you know. He was truly the cosmopolitan scholar looking at Islamic uh, uh, ethical concepts and philosophy as part of his study of uh, Buddhist uh, philosophy, uh, Taoist philosophy, European philosophy, so he integrated the study of Islamic philosophy into a wide range, you might say, a kind of multicultural range of philosophical traditions, perhaps in that way implicitly um, deconstructing the Euro-centered tradition in the teaching of modern philosophy. Uh, Dr. Assemble, I think um, we sort of... Yeah. Well, I think we can give you 10 minutes maybe to sort of bring things together. Yeah, because together. I'm towards the end anyway, you know. Yeah. Uh, so Izutsu's career is very significant in this respect. Now, I also want to look at the uh, Tatar Muslim diaspora because the diaspora, Tatar Muslims or others who came, escaped to Japan, they play a role here too because they are the ones who forged the Tokyo uh 
Islamic Community, officially that's their name. Uh, the Islamic School in Tokyo, originally in English known as the Tokyo Mohammedan School, by the way. Note, please, you know, the uh, sort of adoption of uh, uh, this very Christian uh, traditional terminology by the Japanese. Uh, one very important figure was Kurban Galiev or Kurban Ali, who imported Arabic printing types from Egypt and established the Tokyo Islamic Printing Center and printed the first Quran in Japan. And actually, the Japanese authorities disseminated copies all over the Muslim world. They sent them to Saudi Arabia, to Turkey, to Egypt, everywhere. Finally, establishing the Islamic school, which I find important, it's called Tokyo Mekteb Islamia, because, you know, this Islamic school was very much a resuscitation of the late 19th century Tatar modernist vision for Muslims and Islamic education. In other words, yes, we need to adapt ourselves to the enlightenment and to modernism, but we have to do it with our identity was the Tatar response to the uh, Russian enlightenment of the 18th century. And ironically and sadly, they could only establish their school in Tokyo in diaspora conditions, teaching English, Japanese, Tatar, and the students were uh, actually became quite uh, famous and uh, they also were able to take the university entrance exam in Japan. Many of them studied in Keio University and other universities uh, during that time. Um, Ibrahim and the network that the Japanese established in the late 19th century returned back to Japan in 1933. 1933 is a period of sort of launching, if you will, this Islam policy actively in the mainland of China and in South Asia, East Asia as well. Uh, his meeting together with the diaspora community leader Kurban Galiev with important Japanese diplomats, politicians, military officers. Anything that you see in terms of Japan's Islam policy during these years is linked with Japan's uh, imperial strategy, networking strategy, and ultimately, of course, of the war, the Second World War. Uh, Ibrahim conducted the Islamic funeral ceremony for Haji Nur Tanaka Ipe, who died after his last pilgrimage in 1934. And Japanese dignitaries, top members of the government, and the army and navy attended. This is May 12th the opening of the Tokyo Mosque as a symbol of Japan's portrait or face as the savior of Islam. It's this building itself, which by the way is, you know, um, a news in Japan, you know, in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in Le Monde, in the, the Times, I mean, it's international news, it's uh, made the first page. Uh, by the way, a minister from Saudi Arabia's embassy or legation in London also attended this opening. This is Kobe Mosque of 1938. This is the uh, Tokyo Mosque. Unfortunately, it's not standing in its original form anymore. Now, I'm going to uh, end up with an enigmatic story. Uh, unfinished business in terms of, you know, uh, historical investigation. The enigmatic story of the Muslim transnational and the Japanese encounter in Xinjiang in 1933. Prince, or rather former Prince, Abdul Kerim Efendi, the grandson of Abdullah II, uh, the last powerful Sultan, if you will, effectively, of the Ottoman you know, uh, dynasty, who grew up exiled in Damascus, accepted the invitation to sail to Japan with his cousin, Orhan Efendi, to wait being groomed to be flown to Urumqi and enthroned as the Sultan of East Turkestan. Now you might think this is a crazy story looking at it in hindsight, but remember 1931, Manchurian invasion. 1932, Puyi is taken to Manchuria and uh, enthroned as the emperor, if you will, of Manchu Kuo. So that some uh, policymakers of the imperial army had a very serious plan 
to do the same in Xinjiang because in 1931, a regional rebellion erupted known as the Kumul Rebellion, Kashgar Rebellion of nationalists, local uh, leadership. Uh, and there is in fact a rebellion going on in the region. So the Japanese, they wanna turn it to their you know, advantage. A rare photograph, and I want to finish my talk with this. This is Sherif Tefik Pasha. This is a photograph from the family album. He is in Xinjiang, or East Turkestan, as the rebels of the time called it. And if you look at it carefully, he's groomed in his very formal, you know, traditional robe. And behind him, you can see in the shadows, a uh, gorilla a special kind of uniform, a kind of, you know, uh, maybe guerrilla fighter. He is actually one of the fighters of the East Turkestan rebellion, his personal guard. Uh, this is the Swiss doctor who literally saved the life of Tevik Pasha because he was wounded in battle. He slipped into Xinjiang like many um, ex-officers, uh, militants, uh, I call them the spillover, you know, uh, diaspora of the young Turks after the loss of the Ottoman Empire. In uh, um, diaspora setting all over, you know, Europe, Africa, and the, the Near East and India, some of them, they joined this uh, rebellion and Tevik Pasha was one of them. He, he almost died, you know, in the battle. This is a note from his son, Adnan Sherifolu of Turkey, Turkestan, 1933. Our late father with Swedish mission doctor, John Anderson with father, bodyguard, standing. So uh, Dr. Anderson apparently literally saved his life. Uh, when Tefik Pasha arrived in Tokyo, the Tatar community greeted him as a hero. He was the hero who tried to save the, you know, Turkistanis from uh, Russian Chinese yoke. And they immediately, of course, surrounded him, you know, how it is, the tradition, you know, sort of eligible uh, young man kind of situation. So he, he was immediately married off to a Tatar lady, a young woman with great, you know, uh, celebration. Later on, he became the Imam of Shanghai Mosque. So with that note, I want to finish my talk. Sorry, I think I've gone over about 10 minutes or so. Thank you for your patience and I'm ready for your questions. Oh, thank you so much. That was a very enriching and wonderful talk. I mean, especially the part on Tawfiq Pasha because- Yeah, he's, he is a, a he's an interesting figure. Yeah, and I've encountered references to him in the past. Um, so it was, I think you, you delved deeper than most of the references I've seen. Uh, although I think there's still much that needs to be answered about this figure, who he is. Yes. And how well, he came, when he came to Tokyo, after, you know, he was um, uh, rehabilitated in the uh, army hospital. I mean, uh, they, the Swedish doctor sort of saved his life, but he had all the bullets in him. So, you know, they completely sort of rehabilitated him and... Uh, uh, he had to undergo some further surgery and so on in the military hospital. He gave two interviews to the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I love it. Um, I mean, not that I support what he's saying, but I mean, it's kind of like this typical kind of, you know, can do, will do mentality of a lot of people at that time. You know, he says, I'll give you 12 principles how to destroy the British Empire. If you follow my, you know, um, uh, agenda, no problem will destroy the British Empire. I can imagine the Japanese people, yes, well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, he, he was a young Turk. He was a very close friend of Enver Pasha, by the way. Interesting. And worked for him. Very interesting. Actually, I mean, I um, uh, before I ask my question, I wanted to just tell the audience that if you have any questions or comments, please do type them in the QA box below and I'll read them out. Um, I had actually one question when you were talking about the attempt uh, by the deposed grandson of uh, Abdul Hamid II to install himself as, you know, the Sultan of East Turkestan. 
it reminded me of another attempt by, I think, Bertram Sheldrake, who is also a sort of a British convert to Islam. Yes. yes. And it's similar period, really. And I'm wondering then that as the Japanese began to pursue a conquest of China from, say, after Manchuria, 1931, yeah. and then the formal invasion in 1937, how did, what were some of the proposals that were forwarded by Muslim activists, these figures that you look at, about creating Muslim principalities in China or other parts of East Asia? I don't think that people talk a lot about that in the scholarship. No, they don't, because it's a two-way street, uneven. One is an empire, the other, just vulnerable diaspora. You know, they don't have any personal power, but you need both for the development of strategies like this, you know. Uh, actually, we know the individuals who discussed all of this with uh, an important admiral of the Navy who liked the idea and a couple of people. It's not a Ministry of Foreign Affairs project. They were horrified, but then 30s, you know, Nobody listens to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. I mean, officers, they just, you know, uh, they take it upon themselves to do whatever they want to do, like invading Manchuria, you know. They didn't inform the prime minister, by the way, you know. <laughs> he learned it, uh, shocked at the news, like everybody else. So, uh, in other words, uh, one was uh, the community leader of the Tatar, Kurbanganias. In other words, he, he really thought this is an idea, maybe inspired from, you know, uh, Puyi, remember, Puyi, emperor, um, pro-Japanese. Mm -hmm. Also remember, little known fact, Puyi's brother converted to Islam because he was married to a Muslim lady, I think, a Chinese Muslim lady. Uh, so- You can tell the audience who Puyi is because maybe some people- Oh, them. Puyi is the puppet emperor uh, the last emperor of the uh, toppled uh, Qing uh, dynasty in 1911 with the Chinese revolution, who was kind of, you know, uh, so, sort of remorseful and uh, basically living a kind of exile, what exiled, you know, emperors do. I mean, you know, sort of like living on his own with his entourage in China. Well, the Japanese convinced him to uh, basically collaborate and become the emperor of Manchu Kuo. In other words, separating Manchuria, which is Northeast uh, China today, from China proper, because there was civil war, there was confusion. Uh, the Chinese nationalist government was not in charge actually of that territory, and therefore create a pro-Japanese polity, a puppet regime, if you like. Therefore, uh, Kurban Galiev, I'm, in my opinion, was inspired, saying, okay, let's revive the Ottoman dynasty in uh, the hinterland of Inner Asia, and Musin Chapunolu, who was an interesting figure, who uh, self-exiled himself from the Republic of Turkey, because number one, he was against the extreme secularization of the Kemalis, number two, because his uh, uncles had just uh, concocted a rebellion in their local region, because they were a notable family. And of course, the Republican authorities crushed it. So he had to get out of the country. But he didn't like, you know, um, a Turkey's Republican regime. So he personally helped in making these connections of contacting uh, um, Abdul Kerim Efendi in Damascus, I guess, convincing him. And maybe he was, a, I think he was a sort of, uh, um, Depressed soul. I mean, uh, these are all very interesting figures. I mean, even Qurban yeah, Ali, I think yeah. he was being cultivated to become the next Mufti in Urfa yes. by, uh, uh, by the Tsarist authorities. Yes. Um, so we have actually multiple questions that have come in. Uh, okay. Maybe we can take them one by one. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Hamad Ramezan, who is one of our colleagues here at the center. Were there any famous journals or manifestos published or distributed by the Japanese empire expressing its support and transnational na nationalism in any way to several parts of the Muslim world and especially Turkey? Yes. Well, for one thing, uh, Kurban Galiev, that's why he was uh, supported 
the Japanese supported him in buying uh, the Arabic uh, type, you know, uh, printing uh, printer from Egypt, transporting it all the way to Tokyo to establish the uh, Tokyo Matpai Islamie, is the official name, uh, and uh, uh, because he was printing a journal known as Yeni Yapon Mukbiri, meaning uh, news from uh, Japan, New Japan, news from New Japan, uh, printed in Tatar Turkic language with some Arabic sections and distributed mostly for the Tatar diaspora, but not just in Japan, you know, you have the Tatar diaspora in Shanghai, you have them in Manchuria, in North China, so kind of like the Japanese empire's uh, Tatar journal, if you will. Now, later on, uh, when Ibrahim arrived, uh, Avrish Ibrahim uh, from the late Meiji period, who had close relations with the Japanese, he arrived as an elderly, uh, actually, person in 1933. He also helped the publication of Arabic pamphlets, journals, and so on. And also, of course, the publication of the Quran that was important, that was good public relations, if you will, gesture on part of the Japanese authorities. Uh, it was distributed all over, you know, uh, the uh, colonial territories and sent to uh, main centers of uh, Muslim, you know, uh, uh, communities and countries. Uh, also, the Tatars published uh, Milli Yol, which is sort of like a nationalist uh, journal, Milli Bayrak meaning a national uh, flag, a kind of nationalist journal. Uh, there's also Japanese, um, uh, their own, you know, Japanese public relations publications published in Japanese about, you know, uh, how uh, Islam is an important religion and how um, Europeans have, you know, sort of uh, prejudiced against Islam. And this is not true, a kind of sort of, uh, a uh, proto saidian argument, if you will, of criticizing uh, the Orientalist. Uh, uh, the Japanese did this before Edward Said, by the way, of you know criticizing the Orientalist uh, discourse of uh, Western scholarship and so on. So there's a lot of publications, what I would call public relations to propaganda, okay, in Japanese. And uh, for those of you interested in this kind of literature, you have to first uh, contact Waseda University. Their library has the collections from the Islamic activities of the 1930s and 40s. That was discreetly turned over to Waseda University when the Americans occupied Japan. So fascinating. Um, and certainly nothing new under the sun. I mean, this also practice continues today by many exactly. powers. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. My point. And uh, let's take the second question. Um, this one comes from Razwan Rafi Togo. He asks, the imperial Japanese occupation of Muslim majority Malaysia, present day Malaysia, has a legacy of massive war crimes and human rights violations. Was the Japanese attitudes towards Islam in Malaya an extension of their overall policy of oppression of the local population, or did they use Islam as a tool of their policy of dividing the Malay and the Chinese populations on ethnic lines. Uh, second point, because I just had a student of mine who was uh, educated in the uh, International Islamic University of Malaysia. Uh, she found me a couple of years ago and said, uh, I want to do uh, a master's uh, a thesis on uh, Asian, in Asian studies. Fortunately, she had picked up also the Malay language, so that's good and her English was not so bad. So I had her do a thesis on Japanese policy towards ethnic communities during the occupation of the Malay Straits. It's very interesting. In other words, it's, um, I guess, from an imperialist perspective, a divide and rule policy. They privileged the Malay, who apparently had some uh, difficulties of being given, you know, uh, authority during the British uh, colonial uh, era. And so they are given a kind of extra privilege, if you will. Uh, 
uh, but they also were very anti-Chinese. In other words, you can blame the Japanese if you want for the ethnic divide and the conflictual you know, um, experience that is a legacy for post-war Malaysia as well. She proved this, in other words, Japanese privileging. And also, of course, you know, interesting connections there. Uh, definitely, wherever the Japanese went, they privileged the Muslim population there against the other populations. In other words, fostering this uh, ethnic, if you will, uh, polarization uh, that didn't disappear when they disappeared, it remained. Um, they also had support though. It's not a one-way street. Uh, Malay sultans helped the Japanese occupation of Singapore. They uh, lent their palaces, which had a view of the coastal line of Singapore so that the Japanese could, you know, organize their uh, invasions. Uh, the uh, colonial brief uh, governor of Singapore changed the name to Shonan, was Tokugawa uh, <clears throat> Yoshichika, a very interesting skion, a descendant of the old shogunate, you know, uh, clan, as you know very well. Some of these aristocrats also play a kind of uh, interesting cultural uh, game here, you know. It's not just the army. It's some of the... Uh, vestiges of the old feudal aristocracy. And they're the ones who are kind of prone to the idea of Asianism. For example, Yushchika was an expert in Malay language. He was one of those rare scholars of Malay literature and a good friend of the sultans, therefore, from before, kept going to, you know, um, visit the, and stay for long periods in their palaces. And therefore, you know, this played a role, okay? In Malay support of some circles amongst the Malay, of course, not everybody, but some circles of Malay support for Japanese occupation. So it's a kind of gray area there. Well, it's interesting also, I think after the Japanese invasion of Southeast Asia, as I remember seeing these maps of their future political arrangements for the region. And, you know, Malaya, Philippines are clearly designated as future independent states. Yes. But Indonesia, they're quite quiet about it <laughs> because it seems... <laughs> but, but they <laughs> declare its independence at the last minute, if you should remember. Yeah. Just before surrender, uh, they do end up, well, they're basically losing the war, so they need all the help that they can. Indonesia, of course, was a big debate because some military uh, policymakers thought it's, Indonesia is too rich in natural resources. We can't give it up immediately. So it should be a mandate like the British in Iraq or the French in Syria is the model in their mind. But there are other military officers who say, hey, no, we promised them independence. They will get independence. And of course, uh, if you look at the work of uh, Harry Bender, you know, uh, seminal work on uh, uh, the Crescent and uh, the Sun in uh, uh, Indonesia, and more recent work of uh, people doing work on, you know, uh, the Japanese period of uh, Southeast Asia, you'll see that the Japanese uh, military officers helped train uh, the jungle guerrilla fighters to make sure that when the Dutch return, it's not gonna be an easy life. So the Japanese left a kind of, shall we say, unexploded or uh, soon to explode a uh, hand grenade, you know, as they were leaving the area. Yeah, I mean, they, they facilitated the independence of Asia, perhaps not in the way that they had imagined. But... No, of course not, absolutely not. The last question that we have, and it's good because now we only have five minutes, uh, and uh, Omer Enes, uh, he asks, is there any evidence if Abdul Rashid Ibrahim, uh, the Tatar uh, transnational yeah, yeah. activist, had met Subhash Chandra Bose of India? Mm, and good question. 
Oh, there's a there's a follow up question. Uh, okay. How do you see the interaction between Japanese Pan Asianists and Indian Pan Asianists in the context of what you're talking about? Well, first, did Ibrahim meet Chandra Bose? I suspect not, because they moved in different circles. You know, Ibrahim is with uh, uh, Japanese scholars, Pan Asianist intellectuals and army officers who are in the network of Islam policy. So that's a separate network. Then, um, now, of course, Subhas Chandra Bose is also kind of higher up. In other words, he was, as you know, brought to the uh, Indian Ocean by the uh, German uh, submarine and turned over to Japan and became the Maybe leader. Could you give us a quick um, overview of who he is for audience members who don't well, know. Well, he's the, he's the Japanese, uh, he's the commander of the Indian Army, the Indian National Army, to be exact, which, uh, of course, constituted of officers and soldiers uh, who basically uh, escaped from the British uh, military forces in Chittagong and in uh, uh, Malaysia of today, uh, the Malay area, and they uh, volunteered. You know, come on, uh, the Indian National Army is 40,000 men. So it's, you know, it's not uh, too small, it's not too big, it's not too small, uh, constituting uh, Hindus and Muslim soldiers. And uh, basically the idea is, uh, will fight for Japan and gain our independence. You know, they are collaborating with the enemy of the enemy, basically. I mean, that's the logic of all of this, you know, um, collaboration. Now, Chandra Bose, uh, he's a very interesting figure because he is part of the narrative of uh, uh, the history of Indian nationalism, the history of Indian independence movement, um, when I visited Delhi and I visited the um, uh, <clears throat> Museum of Gandhi, and I saw that there was a pamphlet uh, which uh, uh, narrated the conversation between Gandhi and Chandra Bose. Now, of course, Chandra Bose um, disagreed with Gandhi and the other uh, leaders of Indian uh, nationalism because he said, well, the time has come for armed struggle. I'm tired of speaking. We just have to revolt and we have to arm ourselves because otherwise the British are just not going to listen. Uh, and I thought, of course, the British tried to, you know, um, kind of uh, totally um, uh, represent him as a kind of traitor, uh, leader of a mutiny, you know, uh, like the 1857 uh, Indian mutiny, they like to call it. Uh, but uh, the pamphlet was very respectful towards Chandra Bose. So I asked Dr. Anand and I said, you know, what's the Indian opinion of Chandra Bose? I mean, uh, he was considered to be a kind of uh, unforgivable traitor to the British Empire and a militant uh, advocating armed revolt and all that. He said, yes, that may be true, but uh, uh, Indian... Uh, opinion in the end of the Second World War was very respectful of him. In other words, they had to be quiet because the British authorities considered him a traitor. But he said, at our hearts, uh, we didn't think he was a traitor. We just thought that he was maybe mistaken about assuming that Japan is going to be a you know, uh, liberating force. In fact, lately, there has been a rehab of uh, Chandra Bose, I know that there were some ceremonies, you know, kind of uh, in memory of his uh, contribution to the independence of India. And uh, I believe that uh, Sudhata Bose has written a biography because I believe that Chandra Bose is his uncle or uh, relative from his father's side. Um, but that's a totally different circle. Ibrahim didn't meet him. Uh, but he might have met another Bose, a Behar Bose, who was a kind of, uh, uh, again, a refugee and, uh, in emigre status living in Tokyo, in um, Shinjuku. And uh, he might have met him. I sort of have a suspicion because they were kind of similar at the level of interaction with the Japanese. Um, 
you know, I kind of grew up in Tokyo and uh, very early on, 1960s, I was a young you know, uh, university student. And there were many Indian restaurants in Tokyo of former officers of the Indian National Army. They, they, they were around. These connections never go away. <laughs> no, they never disappear. They're always there. They're always there. Dr. Simple, I cannot uh, express my thanks and gratitude uh, to you. I am really humbled and impressed, mashallah, by your encyclopedic knowledge. Um, and I could listen to you for hours. <laughs> Unfortunately, our time has come to an end uh, for yes. this event. Yes. Um, but on behalf of the King Faisal Center for Research in Islamic Studies, I'd like to really express my deep thanks to you. and. We really hope to have the opportunity, inshallah, at some point in the future to host you in Riyadh. Um, and uh, I'd also like to thank the audience members for joining us here today. Yes, it's a uh, nice group, sizable group for an exotic topic like this. <laughs> you know? Well, it's becoming more and more mainstream, I hope. I think so too. I think so too. I'm glad to say with work, your work, uh, the work of young scholars, I think it has, you know, uh, expanded. Now it can be considered to be an interesting field of modern history. Yes, I think so. And on that note, um, I'd like to just say that the event has come to a close and I encourage the audience members, if they have any further questions, to email Dr. Assemble or myself. And uh, please keep an eye on our social media uh, for future events. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your questions, uh, very interesting questions as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.